a very good morning and a hearty welcome to one and all present here. I, Sharvin Shah, on behalf of ASSMS Institute of Information Technology, feel privileged to welcome our today's guest, Sharvin the Post Officer, Chairman and Managing Director of Pushkaraj Group, Honorable Prince B. Manisar, all the respected HODs and faculty members, and all my dear friends. I would first of all wish all my friends, future engineers, and all the faculty members a very happy Engineers Day. Today, we all have gathered here to mark our respects for all the feats achieved by engineers throughout history. Engineering community across India celebrates Engineers Day on 15 November every year as a tribute to the greatest Indian engineer, Bharat Ratna Mokshagundam Vishweswarya Sir. Sir was born on 15th of September 1861 in Chikkabalapur. After completing his engineering, he has been appointed as assistant engineer at NASIC in government sector. As an engineer, he achieved some marvelous feats. He planned a way of supplying water from the river Sindhu to a town called Sukkur. He devised a new irrigation system called the block system. He devised steel doors to stop the wasteful flow of water in dams. Sir was also the architect of Krishnaraja Sagara Dam in Mysore. The list is actually endless of all the marvels that he has created. Sir M. Vishweswarya was honored with Bharat Ratna in 1955 for his invaluable contribution to the nation. When he reached the age of 100, the government of India brought out a stamp in his honor. Sir Vishweswarya passed away on April 14, 1962 at the age of 101. We celebrate Engineers Day on 15 September every year to pay our respect to Sir Vishweswarya on his birth anniversary. So now, Let's begin with the program. I would now request Avantika Shinde to begin with the Saraswati Vandana.
Thank you, Avantika. That was really beautiful and melodious. I would now request Honorable Principal Dr. P. B. Manesh to say a few words. Ah, uh, thank you, Ravan. A very good morning to one and all present for this uh, celebration of the Engineers' Day, uh, the birth anniversary of. Our beloved engineer Sri Vishwesharaya. Uh, first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our uh, today's guest speaker, Mr. Shailendra Goswami, uh, who has been associated with our institute. Yeah, madam. Mani sir, voice is a little Is it okay now? Hello. Uh, if it is a little louder, it will be better. Hello. 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 I'll, I'll just check. I'll check. Just check my volume. Just, just wait, ma'am. Yeah. Hello. Is it okay now? Uh, Hello. Yes, sir. It is. It is better now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so <laughs> once again, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, welcome our today's guest speaker, uh, Sri. Shailendra Goswamiji, who has been associated uh, with our institute since long back, and he has been uh, helping us in many ways. Uh, generally, uh, what we have seen is that we as engineers uh, celebrate this Engineers Day every year. Uh, one thing I just want to uh, say on this event is that uh, what we are observing is that uh, whatever updations or whatever we see around us today i feel that it is purely because of the contribution of the engineers in building this overall world as such i just read somewhere that uh, god created the engineers and engineers build the world i i think that this is an appropriate statement because uh, we see the beautiful wonders which have been made because of the contribution of the engineers surely there uh, are others also but the major contribution is from uh, the engineering community and uh, i feel that it is a great day for all of us that uh, we are being recognized for the work which we are doing not only for our nation but for the uh, universe or the world as a whole uh, so once again uh, without taking much of my time your time uh, i would once again, like to welcome our guest speaker, and once again, I would like to wish all uh, the students and all the faculty members who have joined for this program. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your precious words. I would uh, now moving ahead. We are here today to attend a talk on the topic challenges faced and opportunities opened up for the industry during COVID. We all are aware of the situation that has arisen in our industry due to COVID. Many have lost their jobs, faced hard challenges, and not found enough opportunities in the industry. So to enlighten us on this topic, we have our today's guest and speaker, our very own Mr. Shailendra Goswami, sir. Welcome, sir. Mr. Shailendra Goswami, sir, is currently working as a chairman and managing director of Pushkaraj Group based in Pune, India. Sir is an alumni of College of Engineering Pune and I am Bangalore and excels in the field of marketing, finance and systems. He has worked in the corporate sector for 15 years and started his, his own ventures in the year 1992, which is almost 20 year, 20, 28 years in business. Sir has been on the corporate advisory boards, board of studies, academic councils of many management institutes and engineering colleges and also a member on advisory board of various manufacturing and IT companies. He has been a very active speaker on both domestic and international platforms on a variety of subjects in management, economy, Indian business environment, global businesses, person allied developments, entrepreneurship, industry institute interface, productive employment, effective communication, advanced manufacturing and industry 4.0, make in India, nation first, Atmanirbhar, etc. The list goes on. Overall, we can see that Sir has had a rich 43 years of experience in the industry and corporate world 
contributing to building business strategies, creating values, and future preparedness for the industry, academy, and society at large. Today, we are privileged to have such a great personality with us. A very hearty and sincere welcome to you, sir. We are deeply honored to listen to your talk and experience. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction and the preamble. And uh, let me begin with thanking uh, uh, the AISSM Institute and the management for giving me this uh, opportunity to be with you today on the auspices of uh, Engineers Day, celebrating birth anniversary of Dr. Vishweshwaraya. And uh, we have always known him for what he did. And uh, today is uh, a sort of uh, acknowledgement uh, to his deeds that uh, we are discussing. And I'm very fortunate enough as an engineer, I have been given this opportunity to talk in front of uh, you all engineers. At this moment, I think more than 129 people are there listening to me, whatever I'm saying. So my shoulders are becoming a little more heavier by a second or by a minute. So nevertheless, uh, meaning I have been uh, very fortunate to be associated with AISSM for last, I think, more than a decade or so, where uh, I look at uh, Dr. Mane as a personal friend uh, more than anything else. And uh, he has been seeking uh, uh, whenever uh, he requires something for AISSM, um, a request to me or a phone call or some kind of a discussion. Although so far pre-COVID, it had been a physical uh, contact where I used to visit your premises and have spoken on many different topics in your uh, audio, auditorium there. But then uh, the last two years have been uh, different. And at least uh, in the last 16 months, uh, we have been operating digitally and I have learned to really speak to my laptop rather than speaking to the audience, which I'm more used to it. So far, maybe in the last so many years, I may have delivered uh, more than five to 600 uh, such sessions on 60 to 70 different topics, domestically and international. But uh, the, uh, I won't say a Guinness uh, record, but <laughs> a record or so in the last 16 months uh, that I have done more than 43 or 44 webinars. And it has become uh, very much possible only because of this digital revolution. Because what it takes uh, at the most is one hour of speaking and maybe 15 minutes of uh, uh, preparation earlier. So it is in one hour, 15 minutes with no logistics problems. You know, I go across to an audience like this at this moment, 140 is still ticking. And uh, it really gives me that advantage. Although I am in the older generation, I could say so. I'll be completing 69 years in November and getting into 70s. Uh, even then, I feel that, that uh, when I get into a gathering like yours, I feel much younger and I feel like spending more time and talking to you on different concepts, which I have kept myself updated. Now, talking about uh, COVID uh, in last 14, 16 months, I have been uh, discussing this subject uh, periodically on different platforms, domestic as well as international and its effects uh, like challenges, what I have said. And uh, naturally, when I talk about challenges, I always talk about opportunities because I firmly believe that every challenge has an opportunity uh, um, hidden in that. Uh, like we say uh, in our uh, Marathi that Ek dar ki dar or a door closes, 10 doors open. So it should be your intellect or wisdom which should let you see those 10 doors opening at you. Uh, rather than uh, we cribbing about a door which has closed on you. And this is uh, the kind of a positive approach I have uh, uh, really taken in my life uh, to lead uh, successfully so far. And I have not been bothered by such uh, problems of pandemic or whatever recessions or uh, retrenchments or things like that. But as I said that every problem has at least one solution, if not many. And it is you who should decide how fast you reach that particular solution. And this kind of uh, motivational attitude or positive approach can always uh, take you stay clear of all such problems or challenges. That is why I selected that topic when I say challenges faced. Yes, 
there are going to be challenges or there are challenges which we have faced and which we are going to face in future as well. But yes, there are going to be opportunities which have opened up because of uh, COVID uh, for industry, for individual, for families or for society at large. And this is what uh, I think we will be just uh, touching base on uh, in this uh, 45 minutes uh, which have been given to me. And uh, let us see how best we can utilize this. And certainly, of course, I would be willing to answer questions uh, if they are. Um, and I like answering questions uh, rather than doing a monologue like this. But then certainly I would lead you to a topic uh, um, and uh, give you certain parameters which I feel are important in understanding these challenges and opportunities. Now, to start with uh, the challenges, what are those challenges? Let us define it. The first and the foremost challenge, which I personally feel is about COVID itself. Everyone is saying that the COVID will end, the COVID will have third wave by October, or uh, we will get over with all this uh, by December or things like that. Well, I would not get into all this uh, statistical um, uh, conundrum. And I would always believe that yes, the COVID is, has been there for the last 16 months and it is going to be there with us. And that is where we have to learn to live with COVID. Like we always say, there are two aspects of uh, say, uh, life. Uh, one is life and second is livelihoods. So whether we should live uh, and simultaneously we should work for our livelihood is the million dollar question which everyone has to ask. And today when we are saying that when this pandemic will get over, I am not going to give any kind of assurance based on the readings I have done or whatever it is, because they keep changing every day. Because every day today, uh, we are talking about India where we have got 61% uh, of our population vaccinated. Uh, today at the same time in America, the numbers are going up or in China, the numbers are going up. People are talking about lockdowns here and there. So, you know, the situations are varying from time to time. And therefore, let us not get into that jungle of uh, facts which are being twisted or which are having different colors than white or black. So what we will say that fine, COVID is going to be there in whatever percentage it is going to be there. We have to learn to live with that COVID. Now, the challenge because of this COVID uh, has been on personalities, on mental health or well-being or health issues of people because a lot of people who have been uh, forced to live uh, or work uh, from home have undergone a tremendous amount of mental stress, no exercises and all that has affected mentally, emotionally and that is where people have to learn to balance uh, their um, emotional uh, whatever say quotient or the mental health. And this is where the psychology or the psychiatrists have taken the lead to really create motivational concepts and try to keep people floating as far as this particular pandemic period is concerned. And I always believe that if you think uh, in that direction, yes, uh, we are going to survive. Like many of the leaders in the industry have said, that the first and the foremost objective in this particular pandemic has got to be that we need to survive. With whatever amount of energy that we have it, we need to learn to have the techniques of survival. Once we survive, whenever this pandemic subsides or uh, reduces, at that time we can think of our livelihood or we can create that kind of a livelihood uh, environment and then we can continue our life with it. But then if we don't survive, there is no question of we going forward. So the, what is more important is to survive. Like many of, as I said, many industrialists, uh, leading industrialists have uh, put it in um, this thing. So what I'm uh, looking at when I talk about challenge, first and foremost is COVID, the knowledge about COVID, the treatments, the vaccination, the mental health and learn to live with COVID. So this is one of the biggest challenge, uh, what I feel should be narrated uh, right in the first. The second challenge as far as the industry is concerned, this COVID related challenges were related to individuals, families and naturally to businesses. But the second one is related to the industry that is restoring of operations. We have had lockdown one, two, three, four, uh, opening up of lockdowns one, two, three, four, series of that. In that there are several things which uh, uh, happened and a lot of uh, concepts took beating or a lot of uh, effects the industry has had 
in which one of the biggest was the workforce. The uh, workforce which is constituting local uh, labor, which is contributing uh, migrant laborers, which is constituting uh, skilled, uh, semi-skilled uh, engineers, uh, diploma holders, uh, administrative staff and whatnot. Now, in this, uh, one of the biggest hits uh, the workforce has taken is of coming from migrant laborers who were semi-skilled or skilled people who were living, uh, living in different states and they had to really go back to their states and that is where the industry had to vacate their capacities uh, because of the migrants uh, who have uh, gone to their respective uh, villages or uh, states or residences and that is where the workforce got reduced and therefore the industry suffered. Now, the second uh, most aspect in this workforce, I will also look at it, uh, the point which uh, somebody said it in the preamble is of the retrenchment and the retrenchment was a consequence because uh, the liquidity was the biggest uh, second problem which emerged because when the businesses are not working, we are in the lockdown condition, you know, we need to have the cash flow management uh, done properly. So the liquidity created a big problem. And then naturally cost cutting uh, was the major and the biggest uh, source for cost cutting was the workforce reduction or retrenchment. And there could uh, have been situations which could have been avoided, but then again, survival uh, was most important. So some of the industries who would uh, survive, who thought they would survive, they really took uh, uh, the course to, towards uh, retrenchment and then they saved uh, whatever that money on cash flow that they could save. So that was one of the objectives which was taken. There are some people who did not retrench, but they did some salary cuts. So 50% salary cuts, 40% salary cuts, 10% salary cuts, whatever they could afford. And accordingly, they managed their cash flow. So liquidity was one of the biggest problems which was thrown at the industry. But then the Ministry of Finance, Government of India came to the rescue of all the small medium scale enterprises and the industry as such. And then they offered uh, financial packages in one, two, and three stages, uh, thereby the industry could really take this hit uh, very, very um, sportingly, and uh, they could survive uh, during that particular crisis managing their cash flows. So liquidity even today is a big problem because although we got moratoriums on loans or EMIs, but then ultimately we had to pay the, uh, those EMIs, and today when uh, the situation has eased out, uh, people have required to uh, really meet up uh, all those commitments of EMIs and insurances on taxes and whatnot. But then the businesses haven't come to full grown uh, um, demands, uh, which uh, they had forecasted earlier for the turnover. So the next uh, challenge uh, which was uh, thrown open in restoring of operations was demand management. Now, when each one of us was hit by liquidity, whether on individual level, on a family level, or in society. You know, naturally, we stop purchases, we stop investing, and therefore, uh, the demands uh, took a beating, whether it is a two-wheeler, whether it is three-wheeler, four-wheeler, whether it is FMCG goods, or whatever those real estate properties, or travel, or whatever it, uh, you can uh, look at it. Everyone uh, really was uh, managing their cash in a manner that, that remained with them. So virtually uh, the economy came to a grinding halt. And this is where uh, the demand really took a beating and uh, the demand generation really even today has not coped up with uh, the requirements of the industrial uh, industries and the planning they had made to come up uh, uh, in the green zone. When I say green zone, that uh, trying to make profit, red is loss. And sometimes uh, people try to break even as a part of strategy in such times. So people who were trying to get into the greener zone by uh, forecasting good demands, they did not, even for the festival season, they could not catch up on the forecast. And therefore the demand uh, management uh, really uh, was a challenge which was thrown at the industry. Although slowly we are recovering, like everyone is reading through the papers uh, that the last quarter performance has been quite good. And uh, we should be uh, looking at the upward trends in the coming months. One of the challenges uh, in the restoring operations uh, after uh, workforce liquidity and demand management was the supply chain management. Now, in any particular uh, manufacturing setup, if I say I produce a final product, 
a scooter or a car if you take it that car is made up of so many uh, components and these components come as a part of supply chain which is called as tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 or different kinds of vendors so maybe tier 1 could be an engine supplier tier 1 could be a tire supplier tier 1 could be a transmission supplier or somebody like that tier 2 could be further breaking down in a transmission they must be supplying bolts nuts rubber components plastic components and things like that so that chain supply chain constitutes roughly around eight to nine linkages of different suppliers so if the chain has to move forward all the linkages in the chain have to move forward but then the low down linkages are mostly the small and medium enterprises which really took a very very heavy beating because financially they were not able to cope up with the kind of uh, uh, cash management they were required to therefore even if in a supply chain uh, or a, an eight to nine linkages chain, if one of the linkages falters, the entire chain falters. And this is what was the biggest challenge thrown at the industry of managing the supply chain, keeping uh, all the suppliers uh, alive uh, by providing them injections of liquidity or providing them injections of cash or demands or things like that. There was uh, the last, uh, but not the least, uh, the challenges uh, for restoring of operations was even in spite of uh, these unlocking uh, situations, when uh, the government allowed the industry to run with 50% workforce and things like that, the entire workforce environment had to be changed to accommodate the protocols of COVID, that is mask, uh, masking uh, of individuals, then uh, sanitization, then uh, social distancing. So in an industry which was having a layout uh, or working in eight hours with so many people, we had to reduce it to 50% of them and then convert uh, those balance 50% into second shifts or third shifts and things like that. Therefore, cost of production really went up. Nevertheless, uh, the challenge was to achieve the production. The cost uh, really uh, could be managed in the longer term, but then that was one of the biggest challenges. So after COVID, where I, um, enumerated uh, challenges like when the COVID would end, vaccination, mental health, and to learn to live with it. Restoring operations was the second one in which we talked about workforce, liquidity, demand management, supply chain, and workforce, uh, workplace uh, protocols. The third one uh, in the challenges category was the vulnerabilities which we already had in the industry even before COVID. And this COVID really aggravated that. Uh, what are those vulnerabilities? The vulnerabilities were that we had over dependence on few sectors of the industry. Earlier, we were comfortable, even if we do one business with one company, two companies, we could survive. And that really took a toll in this kind of a situation because if that industry closed down, we had to close down. So the uh, theory or for that matter, the concept is to have multi uh, customer profiles or dependence on multi sectors rather than only few sectors. Now, another thing which uh, really uh, came out as a vulnerability is that we did not automate our processes. We did not migrate to Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is the fourth generation of uh, manufacturing where we have a concept called cyber physical where machines talk to machine. Industry first was totally mechanical where we had power looms and things like that. Industry 2. 0 0.0 was a sort of a automated uh, 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 PLC based uh, manufacturing auto uh, industry three was fully automated process automations and things like that. But industry four was cyber physical in which machines talk to machine with the help of IT concepts like uh, IOTs or artificial intelligence and things like that, thereby increasing the production, thereby scaling up the production, thereby meeting requirements across the globe and things like that. So migration to industry four was not done. Therefore, workforce, which was absent, played a crucial role in reducing our production. If we had migrated to industry 4.0 or done the process automations to the required standards for productivity, we would not have suffered as much. Therefore, I put this in the vulnerabilities which we had. Then second thing was that uh, the low contribution globally was uh, one of our vulnerabilities. Like we were always an inward looking society. 
we always believed that doing domestic business is fine, doing overseas business is all risky, and we never looked at Globe as our marketplace or the world as a marketplace. Rather than that, we focused always on the domestic requirements. And this is where we faltered, because if the domestic market collapses, we need to have something to support. And globally, the world order was changing, and globally, everyone was requiring products manufactured at a cost-effective basis from somewhere. And if India would have positioned ourselves, uh, or rather we would have positioned ourselves as a cost-effective source, then we would have scored even during this particular pandemic. Because the way we had to run our industry in India, everyone else in different countries had to run their industries in their respective countries. So we could have scavenged through the requirements uh, coming from overseas, and then uh, we could have survived very easily. And this is where I consider this as a vulnerability. Therefore, having said all these uh, challenges, so what, are, what should have been the focus areas that we need to uh, really get into the scalability? We need to increase the productivity. We need to talk about the larger volumes. And we need to be a more outward looking society that we should be taking the entire world as our marketplace and then try to give out the products everywhere else. We should be doing a process innovations, process improvements, and then we should introduce concept of modular manufacturing. What is modular manufacturing? Is that we have one line today, and then tomorrow, if the production goes up, we add another module to augment uh, that uh, productivity norms and uh, production, and then accordingly meet up uh, that requirement. And then uh, the biggest uh, hurdle that we have it uh, in scaling up the production is the logistics part of it. Our logistics and supply chain management is not as efficient as it should be. And this is the area where we have to look at. Now, this in brief, uh, I can go for each particular topic or a concept at length, uh, but then for those individual candidates, we can discuss uh, these things uh, much later. But then having said uh, so many things about these challenges, these have been quite a number of them. And to cope up with these challenges was a task which we have done it in the industry in the last 16 months. Today, we are quite comfortable as we are seeing it. The productions have risen to 60 to 70 percent, although not 100 percent. Our GDPs are increasing by numbers. The last quarter performance has been quite good. Therefore, I would not get dejected by all these challenges which were thrown at us. But then, yes, we will definitely bounce back and then come back to our originals and achieve the targets which have been set by our own prime minister. Uh, of reaching at a dollar five trillion economy by 2024. Let us see how it goes about. As we go into the future, we'll keep talking about it. Now, the brighter side of it of the last 16 months have been there have been several opportunities which have been thrown open at us. Now, one of the biggest opportunity which came about even before COVID that uh, U.S. China fell out on trade, and therefore China was one of the biggest uh, source of cost effective. Uh, product supplies or uh, manufacturing basis uh, as far as uh, U.S. was concerned. And this is where two opportunities opened. One was replacement of plants which have been set up in China to be replaced elsewhere. And India became number one contender in that because of uh, our IPR protection, because of our talent, uh, almost 55% of young people available here, a lot of engineers, a very good intellectual capacity which is there with us, which we have shown our prowess in information technology, and now we are showing it in manufacturing and other uh, sectors which we will uh, talk about. So naturally, uh, relocation of uh, manufacturing plant from China, because nobody believed that uh, uh, China would be a long-term partner because of the world order, which is changing. Because emanating uh, from uh, a particular country, this kind of a pandemic, everyone took it to their heart, because even today, after two years, everyone is suffering. So nobody would like to give that further benefit to the country which really started or which they triggered this particular pandemic. That's what everyone is uh, talking about. So relocation uh, from China to India was one of the opportunities which opened. Second opportunities in conjunction to that was uh, the cost-effective sourcing from India naturally because we also uh, had a very good manufacturing setup here. We could compete uh, technically. We could compete on high-tech uh, low volume businesses earlier. China used to really give us a run for their money uh, on low tech, high volume businesses. So if we acquire expertise in low tech, high volume businesses also, 
we will secure a good percentage of markets uh, overseas. So cost effective sourcing from India had gone up in last 16 months and I'm a personal beneficiary of that because we are in this kind of a business of providing services or providing um, sourcing from India to overseas customers in Europe and America. So I can vouch it from my own experience that this opportunity definitely did open and it really opened up a lot many gates and which we never expected. Now the second, uh, the third largest uh, uh, opportunity which got opened was in different sectors of industry. Like the biggest was e-commerce. E-commerce, uh, there are several examples to which uh, we can easily look at uh, the, the uh, Zomato, for example, did fantastic business. Flipkart did fantastic business. Amazon uh, did fantastic business. Swiggy did, Big Basket did. How many uh, e-commerce uh, platforms we should be discussing to really vouch for the success or the opportunities they got created? You know, uh, e-commerce virtually uh, became the uh, word uh, uh, which uh, really floated around in everywhere and uh, they were providing all the products and services in this pandemic or in this lockdown when people were virtually locked into their houses. We could eat or we could feed ourselves only because of such e-commerce uh, platforms which were available. So e-commerce was one of the biggest gains uh, or opportunities which got opened in this particular thing. The second aspect or uh, the second sector which opened up was uh, the healthcare. In healthcare, we can talk about uh, pharmaceuticals, we can talk about medical electronics, and we can talk about medical equipments, and we can talk about vaccines. You know, vaccines, we have become one of the biggest producers of vaccines. In nine months, we created two vaccines. And today, we are almost uh, 75 crores uh, of uh, our population has been vaccinated. We exported vaccine to almost 70 countries free of cost. It's a very nice gesture which gave us a tremendous uh, bandwidth uh, in our international relations on the world platform. That is where in the recent elections, we got almost uh, 182 votes out of 193 countries. So this is uh, a bigger game uh, which has been played by our government and our uh, administrators that uh, today people look at India as one of the biggest uh, supporters on healthcare products. The third one which uh, really came about was food processing. And we have been uh, the users of all food process products during these lockdowns. Uh, we bought them uh, from e-commerce uh, various sites. And then therefore the food processing became another opportunity which got opened tremendously, which otherwise normal food production, 50% of it goes waste because we do not do it. Uh, processing or we do not put them in cold storages or whatnot. So there has been tremendous amount of technological improvements in food processing and that is where I think this industry is catching up. And another one is the research and development labs who started doing researches on creating vaccines, creating solutions for the industry and uh, creating solutions uh, for uh, health affected uh, society or countries. So R&D became one of the biggest opportunities on the laboratories who were there, they started doing researches and then worked out. Now today I can say that uh, IT, information technology, we were the leaders or the biggest hub as far as the world was concerned. We have added two sectors to that. One is healthcare and second uh, uh, one is manufacturing. So all in all, information technology, healthcare and manufacturing have become the world's uh, manufacturing our world's hub as far as India is concerned and we are catering to the requirements of the world. I think we have achieved a lot, isn't it? And uh, can't we call it uh, as the opportunities which have opened up tremendously. Today, we are catering to the world as far as these sectors are concerned. Of course, there are many more, but then predominantly in this pandemic, these three sectors have emerged uh, as uh, the top three. Now, if really I have to take uh, stock of all what I have said and summarize it, I would summarize it that we need to be very, very optimistic. The future is good and we have to learn to live with COVID. Don't worry about when it is going to go, what it is, whatever we are required to do as a part of protocol, let us follow it. If we are required to be vaccinated, uh, as per the schedule, get vaccinated and stay safe. We will be bouncing back in terms of GDP, of course, the new strategies uh, or uh, new approaches 
lifestyles uh, will have to change uh, and uh, like uh, working from home is becoming the norm as far as industry is concerned wherever administrative staff uh, can work from home they have been working from home wherever physical production uh, is required to be done people are required to be there they have to go there so strategies approaches have been changing and i think they will continue because working from home brings a whole lot of costs down whole lot of logistic uh, pressures down whole lot of uh, rental premises uh, are vacated of course real estate market and hospitality hospitality industry went down because of all these things but then nevertheless there is something else which has given us benefits so we have to look at uh, these things another most important thing in this pandemic whoever stuck to market oriented products they did well i can give you an example of amul industry which did almost 36000 crores of uh, business in this uh, pandemic and then there is another uh, it company called deloitte who did almost uh, uh, quite substantial uh, in billions of dollars they did business only in covid consulting and in people who got affected by covid how should they come out of it so this kind of consulting gave them billions of dollars as far as deloitte was concerned and uh, our own uh, uh, puneri name uh, chitra and uh, they have come out with so many products so many supply chain outlets that today household uh, uh, does not find it very difficult to buy amul or chitrale products uh, from a nook and corner where they are staying so these are couple of examples which uh, are uh, giving me to conclude that whoever created market oriented products companies who did that have survived well and they will survive and this is going to be the norm that we cannot keep on producing a particular product because we have a conviction it is the market which drives the demand and we have to obey the requirements of the market and then work it out so if i could conclude i would conclude it like this that the winds of uh, change winds of change are blowing so naturally what do we install we installed wind turbines and do not install valves walls to stop that winds of change so with that uh, i think i'll conclude uh, my presentation and i am open to take uh, any questions um, uh, if you may have thanks a lot thank you very much yeah thank you very much sir you for your precious words this valuable information and like it is very much helpful for us in our lives thank you for enlightening us will surely work and proceed in the way you have guided us into if anyone have any questions they can just ask or put in the chat box soon it seems like everyone is pretty clear about what you have told about the opportunities <laughs> and the challenges uh, right. it yeah. seems that they are, have all understood what is going on so yeah. now i would like to request desa president aditya dhawar to please propose the vote of thanks well thank you sharvin i esteem it a great honor to propose the vote of thanks to all those who have helped us in making this event such a resounding success first of all i would like to propose a hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest mr shailendra goswami sir for gracing today's event thank you very much sir for sharing this valuable information and enlightening us we will work and proceed in the direction you have guided us i would like to express sincere gratitude to our honorable principal dr pb mane sir for allowing us to conduct this event our first year head of department dr pg mushif sir and the faculty members for their constant support and belief in us i would thank professor jim mavli ma for the orderly execution of the program i would also like to thank professor a h raja sir for his technical support last but not the least thank you to all the staff members and the students for attending this 